All right, I think I'm going to get us started, and uh, we'll see who else jumps in as we're as we're going. Um, I'm Yasmina Zaidman. I'm the Chief Partnerships Officer at Acumen, and thank you all for joining. Um, I think we have almost every time zone across the globe covered. So whether it's early morning, afternoon, or late evening, thank you all for being here. Um, really excited today to host the session um, at SOCAP. Uh, with three women that I admire tremendously. We've had a chance to work together actually over the past year in doing some new research that I think could be really valuable for the social enterprise sector, the impact investing sector, and also the corporate world and the world of inclusion and sustainability in business. So today's session is on driving inclusive growth through corporate social procurement and social sourcing. And the conversation we're going to have today, which we have to have in a a brief 45 minutes, um, is really focused on something that we've been doing research on for almost a year and we could talk about for days. Um, so we'll try to hone in on some of the key lessons from our work and some real world examples from our panelists, um, who I will introduce in a second. But we'll also make sure that we share out with you some of the research um, that we've shared, which includes case studies and quite a bit of data um, our goal in this research was to really focus on where we see examples of corporations doing business with social enterprises. Um, we kind of went into this thinking that this was a huge untapped opportunity, but potentially a challenging area, um, as many people didn't have enough visibility into what was working, what wasn't working, um, where, do we can, where can we see examples of this. So our focus was on surfacing examples of corporate ready social enterprises and then learning from them about what was working and what wasn't. So really that kind of laser focus on what's already going on and what can that teach us about how to really amplify this opportunity. So I'm thrilled today to have with us um, two of the companies, the corporations that have been real leaders in looking for ways to integrate social procurement and business partnerships with social enterprises into their core business, as well as Sumita Ghost from um, Rang Sutra, which is a great example of this and one that's featured um, in our research. Um, Asa Swickstrom Felt, uh, who joins us from IKEA Social Entrepreneurship. Um, and Alexandra Vanderplug from SAP have both been really vocal champions for this idea. So it's really a thrill to have them with us today in the panel. Um, I wanted to start out by really asking each of you um, to share with us kind of your lens on this topic, uh, why this has been relevant for your own organization. And then we'll move into some of the insights that we found from our research. So I want to start with you, Asa, just to share a little bit on why IKEA has taken on this topic um, and how your organization within IKEA, IKEA Social Entrepreneurship, fits into that. Thanks, Yasmina. Pleasure to be here with you all. Well, I think we all have the same big challenges ahead of us. Uh, and we're seeing the climate, we're seeing the growing inequalities, and we really need to come together uh, to also live our founder's vision, which was a better everyday life for the many people. So uh, we started working with philanthropy in IKEA many, many years ago. And then we saw the growing movement of social entrepreneurship. And, and we thought this was an interesting intersection between business and philanthropy. And some 10 years ago, we started to uh, do business with social entrepreneurs because many social businesses uh, need to grow through creating a marketplace. And we found that really uh, intriguing and also uh, gave us new perspectives. And we wanted to specially focus on social businesses that work with people who are uh, vulnerable in many different aspects. It can be living in poverty or uh, living with disabilities or other topics. And based on that experience, we now lately have added uh, some more tools to our toolbox where we also approach not only direct uh, business relationship, but also looking at our whole ecosystem. Where are the vulnerabilities? What is it that needs transformation? And where can we partner with social enterprises and entrepreneurs 
to find innovations that can transform the whole setup. Thank you, Asa. Um, it's something that you said just now that really kind of sparked my thinking because I think the conversation about what is an inclusive and sustainable business has evolved a lot uh, and is becoming a much more important part of the discussion on the role of business in society. And I sometimes feel like the term inclusive can mean so many things. So when you talk about what does it mean to engage with vulnerable populations, first of all, I think that's an important distinction, right? They're talking about groups of people that have been marginalized or faced unique challenges. So as you think of social enterprises that you want to engage with, what are the kinds of impacts that you look for in how they actually engage those communities? And I say that in part because if you think about how businesses touch different groups, they could be considered inclusive simply because they do business with different populations. But a truly inclusive business is actually centering on the needs of those communities and addressing their challenges. So I'm curious, what are some of the kinds of impacts that you've looked for through those business partnerships with social enterprises? Yeah, it's a, it's a very um, great question to look at. And we actually work with uh, a, a tool that is used a lot in a development organization, which is called the theory of change to realize what are the impacts and what are the outcomes and what are the outputs that we're looking for. Because social change is also not a quick fix. You cannot, cannot uh, have the same metrics as you normally would have in a pure uh, financial transactional relationship. This is something else. This is building, evolving, developing, uh, empowering. So we are looking for... Uh, social entrepreneurs that have the social mission in the core and for the business relationships of course they also have to be in a relevant sector that uh, is covered in our home furnishing offer so like with um, Sumita and Ran Sutra working with the craft and textiles for instance but it can also be in services or other uh, customer facing uh, types of partnerships so Social mission at the core, the passion to drive change. And I, I know we're going to hear more from Sumit, but I think in their case, it's also really interesting how they also make all the artisans co-owning uh, the, the company. And so that's, of course, an extra level of growing the incomes, growing uh, the livelihoods of the people on the ground, growing their capacities, making sure that they can develop as people, become managers, and also lead their own enterprise at the end of the day. Absolutely. That's talking about really inclusion at the level of asset ownership um, and participation at a whole other level. So I think it's a perfect segue to Sumita. Um, I would love to hear more about your company, um, how it was developed, and then how you got into the space of working with corporate partners. Thank you, Yasmina, and hello, everyone. So Rangsutra is uh, 15 years old this year. And prior to that, I had uh, worked for many years, several years on the ground as a development uh, practitioner, focusing on social development for, to bring about change. And sometime towards the turn, after the turn of the century, and when we entered the new millennium, uh, and India, I come from India, and India having gone through what we call globalization and opening up of our economy, uh, what I realized was that, you know, we, uh, while some of us in India were benefiting, people like me who had access to education and opportunities, there were many people, especially in rural India and especially women, who, who did not have such opportunities and really needed a hand up, a helping hand to, uh, to sort of, you know, make a better life for themselves. So that's when uh, we thought of starting this organization. And uh, another thing that inspired me was that I came across this uh, survey, the study done by a UN organization, which said that women do... 64 or 65 percent of the world's work earn just 10 percent of the world's income and own about one percent of the world's assets 
so i felt this was totally unfair and we've got to do something so we started this company and uh, actually uh, you know as orsa mentioned the artisans are our shareholders that was partly by default because we did not have an option no one was willing to give us a loan to start up or invest right in the beginning so the 1000 artisans put in 1000 rupees each and that's how we started our company and our mission is really to uh, ensure social economic transformation and change empowerment of women and we do it through crafts handicrafts and handlooms which are you know a tradition in india in any case and uh, we we try our role rang sutra is a bridge between rural artisans especially women and the market through global uh, you know retailers like ikea asa is here and uh, you know so we try to be that strong bridge to link rural artisans to global customers thank you samita um that's an, a really a powerful model and i think you raised this great point as we talk about um inclusive business obviously incomes and living wage are really important but income is not the same as ownership and what we see when we have issues around structural barriers to opportunity whether for women for racial minorities for low income communities that without asset ownership it's really difficult to build wealth um over time so i think it's a really really great model um i'd love to turn now to alex um uh, from sap another company that's been an incredible champion for this um to hear more about how you got involved in this and really how you're pushing the field in ways that i think are really exciting i mean hi it's such a pleasure being with all of you um and i apologize this the sun is coming straight in my face <laughs> but but it's nice right to feel the sun in your face so i'll leave it um you know i think similarly to what also was describing how ikea was going through a journey that started about 10 years ago the same is also true on our end um but also very honestly in the first sort of 5 6 years of working with social enterprises it was very heavily csr driven right so it was maybe not purely philanthropic but it it had a lot to do with us believing in the sector um and us providing so- capacity building to social enterprises working with intermediary organizations creating partnerships with network organizations and the like um significant effort was made there i mean we we created um i think a social investment and an in-kind contribution of over 21 million just through pure capacity building efforts alone but the turning point i would say came about 3 years ago and i don't think it's a coincidence that it was 3 years ago because if you sort of sort of look at how pressures have increased on companies to be not just esg aware but to um to integrate ESG much more closely into their business. A regu- increasing regulation that's coming up not just in terms of climate action but also in terms of supply chain. Um so all of these pressures um have lead to companies needing to um innovate in terms of their business practices and what we saw is that a very easy way to innovate or to um to include ESG practices in SAP was to start building much more closer partnerships with social enterprises and the area that we felt was um was an area for us to explore more was was social sourcing and social procurement um and the 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 reasons for that are actually quite simple if you look at sort of the market size of procurement uh procurement alone um generates 14 trillion US dollars annually in trade um and that is that is procurement that is happening in companies right it's spend that is going on all the time um and at the same time you have the pressures of building not just productive but also inclusive and ethical supply chains um so then it starts to become logical that you're saying well wouldn't it be simpler <laughs> it's not simple but wouldn't it be an idea um to start embedding social enterprises and diverse suppliers into your supply chain um be it through direct spend or through indirect spend and that's basically what we started doing we started putting a stake in the ground and said okay this is we believe in this area 
It's um, let's divert spend that is happening at SAP anyway. Let's divert it towards social enterprises and diverse uh, suppliers. And we created an initiative called 5 plus 5 by 25. But where it becomes even more interesting for us as a business, as a company, is that um, this is not just about our own procurement practices. As a B2B company that helps through our software other companies to run better and run at their best, we said, look, this is actually an opportunity for us to look at how SAP technology can enable our customers in achieving their sustainability goals, particularly in relation to inclusive and ethical supply chains. Um, so it's a combination of both. So it's looking at our own procurement practices and it's driving product development and solution development of our SAP technology to enable our customers um, to achieve their sustainability goals. Thank you, Alex. Um, and it's great to hear the story of that evolution uh, because I think what we've seen both in, in working in the social enterprise sector, which Acumen has done for 20 years and, and many of you have been in that space for a long time, the way that we're really going to move social enterprises into the center of tackling some of these global challenges is really through an ecosystem approach. There isn't really one answer, one way. And it's one of the reasons why it's exciting to talk about this here at SOCAP, because I think this is a community that has been really building that ecosystem. Um, but what's interesting is seeing that where, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about investment and bringing capital to those enterprises, we're now kind of expanding the conversation beyond capital. What are the kinds of capacity and networks and access to markets that can really make a difference? And so we're, again, hearing examples of that. And I want to pull those themes out because I think within this community, we have a lot of the actors that are looking at pieces of the puzzle. And if we can bring them together and frankly, bring corporations in in a much bigger way, I think that's when we'll see the kind of the real emergence of the sector as a player on the global stage in tackling these issues. So I wanted to just go back for a second um, and I want to get into and I've seen some questions coming up in the chat, kind of the question of how. Um, and, and one of the things that our research showed us is that this is already happening. We found 100 great examples of where corporations are sourcing from social enterprises. Um, and we encourage people to check them out. Um, we'll put in the chat a link to a, a microsite that actually includes those 100 examples. And you can learn more about the industries and geographies that they represent, um, but also the companies that they work with, which I think gives a really great sense of the diversity, both on the social enterprise side and on the corporate side. But I think what folks are really interested in is sort of how does this really work? Um, and that's often where, you know, earlier stage social enterprises struggle to say, how do you break through? So I'd love to hear a little bit from you, Asa, when you think about building the infrastructure within IKEA that enables us to bridge the divide, uh, particularly for earlier stage companies. Um, and then I'll ask the same question of you, Sumita, kind of how do you start that journey? Yeah, I, th I think you're going straight to the point because the f I guess the first relationship is the hardest. Mm -hmm. uh, and making it to that corporate ready level is the most tricky part because you don't have a proof of your uh, viability yet. And I know that uh, social businesses like uh, Rang Sutra and others, they struggle to get that first capital and to find impact investors that can work with a mix of grants and loans and uh, later on equity. So when we started, of course, the pure size of IKEA makes it even more challenging, I would say. I think there are a lot of social businesses out there that are corporate ready that you can do business with immediately. But when it comes to a uh, huge scale, we actually had to set up uh, uh, some special uh, business leaders that were working with the social businesses and developing their different capabilities in partnership. So bringing people on the ground that know about design, what do our customers want and like, um, and then combining that sitting on the floor with the artisans seeing what are the capabilities of the artisans and how can we merge this to something that is something our customers want to buy, not because 
it's from a village, but because it's a beautiful product that they would really love to have in their house, then it's a sustainable relationship. So there were many things like that. Of course, there are many aspects of compliance. Where is the material from? How it is being produced? Uh, all the ERP questions and things that you come across when you work with bigger companies. So we really had like a step-by-step -step approach uh, going through the different steps uh, of doing business together. And I know, Sumit, I, I think I can mention how much you have grown over the last seven, eight years. I think you have grown from producing 5,000 pieces to maybe three of our stores, and they were there for six weeks, to producing 700,000 uh, products to all of our stores around the world. So it's an amazing journey, uh, but it does take investment. It is not really business as usual for us. Uh, now, nowadays, maybe more so, but in the beginning, there is a lot of partnership, hand-holding, mentoring, uh, co-investment in both time and resources. Yeah, that's uh, that's a powerful story uh, because, as you said, it's a real journey. Um, so for you, Sumita, how has it been on the other side of that journey in terms of how you've been able to build the relationship and how did you even make that initial connection with IKEA? Yeah, that's interesting. Actually, uh, the first time I met anyone from IKEA was at a at a workshop at a you know we, we were doing this project on the economic empowerment of women in a certain eastern part of our country and uh, we uh, at, and at one of these workshops for our craft managers these are artisan leaders women who showed leadership we met uh, with uh, the IKEA team because IKEA was involved in the funding of the project uh, indirectly to us and uh, and there we made a connection and sort of uh, two years later with many interactions once the women found their strength found their voice built up the skills to make their products uh, we actually took a chance we were quite ambitious and told IKEA that okay now the training is done the you know uh, investment has been made in building capacities now uh, take a chance give us an order and I must say that IKEA was uh, you know the team was very brave I must say to give us an order because we really did not have much on the ground yes there were a bunch of you know 200 very inspiring bold confident confident women who said, we, we can do it, we can make the order. So, uh, so it started off like that step by step, literally step by step. And, um, and I think it was at, at no stage was it just a transaction in the sense of, you know, here's an order, and you fulfill it, and you get the money, etc. But it was a long process of uh, really a lot of uh, a lot of training and mentoring by the IKEA team. And uh, uh, for us to ensure that women from villages are <clears throat> able to make products to supply globally, initially we weren't sure, but uh, it was it it has been a great uh, uh, you know um, I won't say Asa mentioned the theory of change. It has been really a practice of change, and mm -hmm. and you know social development, social and economic empowerment which went side by side. And uh, it's been a great journey, I must say. It's been, uh, of course, we've had our challenges. We've had our tough moments. But all in all, it's been, uh, it's been great. And I think another factor which really helped has been the trust, uh, you know, uh, trust on both sides to ensure that, you know, to sort of um, be open about any problems we are facing, be transparent, and then, uh, you know, make the changes as and when needed. Uh, so, yes, that's how we started. And we are really thrilled to be growing along with IKEA. And uh, we hope to grow even more. Thank you, Sunita. Um, it's, it's great to see the success and I think inspiring to many others. Um, I wanted to ask you, Alex, as you've really started to work on this commitment, um, and I know it's early days, what have you found to make a difference in, again, sort of, 
crossing that initial threshold um, of helping to link companies into your business, or if you've seen them engaging effectively with other companies that are in your networks? That's a good question. And I see that there's some similar questions in the chat as well, right? How do we connect? How do we become a supplier? Um, I think what helped us was um, understanding the landscape of the social enterprise sector and particularly understanding what um, intermediary organizations can actually support us, right? Because honestly, one of the most difficult challenges for us as a corporate is identifying social enterprises uh, and verifying them um, to, for them to actually work with us, right? Um, and we need intermediate organizations, be it Acumen or in the US by Social USA um, or Social Enterprise UK in, in, in the UK. Um, we need organizations like that who, um, who understand the landscape of social enterprises um, and who also understand how to connect us to those enterprises. So I think my first advice is always for a social enterprise uh, who believes that they're corporate ready, make sure you become part of um, those kind of ecosystems that are out there, be it national ecosystems, so national associations, or um, then more global associations and programs like um, what Unilever has built up with Transform, um, or we have built up a partnership with Moving Worlds called Esgrid, because once you enter those kinds of programs, it immediately augments your visibility um, towards corporates. And I think that's what's so important, right? You need to have that visibility. Uh, otherwise, it always becomes this one-on-one -on -one connection. Um, so that is something that we have learned a lot from, just knowing that, you know, we have to partner. We have to collaborate, uh, not just within the social enterprise sector, but frankly, also within the corporate sector. We have learned so much from IKEA, from Unilever, from EY, um, that we wouldn't have been able to do by ourselves. So. Be, never be too afraid to build alliances, right? And build partnerships um, across sectors, but also within uh, the corporate sector um, to drive things forward. Yeah, I think there's a, a, a major need for that. And we're starting to see that momentum. Um, all of us got connected through the uh, World Economic Forum's COVID uh, Response Alliance for Social Entrepreneurs. And it was easier to see where these threads converge so that we could actually do that kind of knowledge sharing. But I just wanted to reinforce the points that each of you made was the value of those networks. Um, and we've mentioned a few, but just again, these are intermediaries and alliances that are really designed to help bridge some of those gaps in terms of visibility and access and often capacity. So, you know, we're thinking of Euclid Network in Europe, the Social Enterprise World Forum, Moving Worlds, Transform, Andy, each of these that create that extra visibility and can often provide other resources like capacity building. Um, but one of the things that I think could create additional breakthroughs is for investors who support early stage entrepreneurs to be thinking about the role that they can play in strengthening those networks. And it's something that we've been asking ourselves at Acumen, how do we really leverage the networks that we have to support entrepreneurs beyond their sort of tackling their immediate business challenges but to really build that access to market. And I think it's a really interesting question for some of the investors at SOCAP to reflect on the role that they can play to really help tap into this movement around social procurement and social sourcing. Um, so I wanted to touch for a second on something that I think is really relevant, um, particularly for some of the social enterprises that might be with us, uh, the question of social impact. And also you touched on this, but when we did our research, we were really amazed to see how many enterprises are not only creating impact, but they're also tracking it. They are uh, tracking against the SDGs. They are doing their own impact measurement. They work sometimes with third parties who can validate that impact. And one of the challenges that came up was how do we get companies to really recognize and value that impact within the scope of their business? Um, so I was just curious to see how some of you have made social impact an important factor in guiding business decisions. Uh, because I think it's like that makes a big difference in opening doors for social enterprises that are really prepared to deliver that impact. Maybe also you could start. Yeah, and I think 
that is the key question to get the whole movement uh, going. So what is the S in the ESG? And what is it beyond compliance? What is it when we talk about development and and tackling, the, for instance, the growing inequalities? So it's much easier to have a digital goal uh, like uh, uh, carbon dioxide or no carbon dioxide. That's very easy to measure. It's yeah. either one or zero. But what is a social target? And I wouldn't say that we have a, a perfect answer to that. I know how we work with IKEA social entrepreneurship. As I mentioned, we have a theory of change. It is actually in the simplified version on our website. I will post the, the, the link in the chat later. Uh, but I do think it's important to acknowledge that social change takes time. Uh, you really need to be in it for the uh, long term. It's long term partnerships that will create impact. Impact is nothing that you can drive over a year or two. You really need to have your vision clear. What is it that like be part of transforming and then put some pathways and make sure that you measure, you monitor, you evaluate and you do long term evaluations as well. Thank you, Asa. And how about for you, Alex? What are some of the, the social impact measurements that you've focused on to really help illustrate the value proposition for working with social enterprises? <clears throat> so we've put it into the context of, and again, this probably has to do with us being a tech company <laughs> who deals with a lot of data. Um, you know, we've put it in the context of the issue of traceability in the supply chain. And anyone who's involved in that knows that it's a complex issue. It's not solved. We have a long way to go with that. Um, and there's at times not just in transparency, but there's da different data sources and sometimes even an overload of data, right? So if you as a company, if you need to demonstrate, and maybe this is, goes more into sort of the risk mitigation compliance side, but sometimes it's a good way to start. Um, if, you're, if you're struggling with demonstrating transparency and traceability in your supply chain, our argument is basically a good way to start overcoming that is using the proxy of social enterprises. Um, because social enterprises, um, you know, they, they are prime mission driven first, right? Social impact is the first goal that they want to reach. It's not necessarily financial performance. So if that is the case, um, and the other thing that we've also seen, and, and I think your research also shows that is Mina, is that often social enterprises can actually also be considered inclusive businesses. Not mm -hmm. always, but most of the time, right? So if that is the case and you're you're lacking transparency and traceability in your supply chain, doing business with social enterprises makes a lot of sense um, because that you will automatically have transparency. You're, you know automatically that you're compliant, right, and that you're mitigating risk by working with social enterprises. So this is maybe just a different angle to it. But I think it's one that, that could potentially work quite well at the moment, especially in light of all of these regulations that are coming to force. Um, you know, in Germany, for example, where I'm based, um, the German parliament has just ratified the um, Supply Chain Act, which is going to come into force, I think, in 2023. Um, and of course, it primarily looks at risk mitigation and compliance um, with regards to an ethical supply chain. But it's a good way to start because it means that businesses have to start looking into it. And if you as a social business, social enterprise can position yourself against that, um, then it actually provides an interesting value proposition, at least to get the foot in the door. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Alex, that the, in some ways the landscape of risk has changed from, you know, you're safest if you have a few big suppliers and they'll sort of work out the details, <laughs> everything's very predictable, to now saying, wait, if we don't have visibility, if we don't have direct access, if we aren't getting information on what this really means at the end of the line at the, or, or upstream supply chain, we are at risk. And that is, I think, an opportunity for social enterprises to really provide huge value add 
um, as new risks are emerging around accountability on climate, inclusion, diversity, et cetera. So I would love to open this up now to questions from the audience, <clears throat> although we've been seeing them as we go. I always have a ton of questions I can ask because I find this so fascinating. So while we're waiting for questions to come in, and please, there's no, no question that is uh, sort of off, off the topic, um, whether you're you know, looking at this as, as an investor, as an entrepreneur, as an intermediary, as a corporation, um, please let us know your questions. But before, since I don't have anyone uh, banging down the door at the moment, um, I did want to ask you, Sumita, if you were to give some advice to social enterprises that want to follow a similar path, you know, what would you tell them? What do you wish you might have known as you started your journey that you now know? Yeah, I think what Alexandra mentioned a bit earlier, you know, that uh, social enterprises, our mission is social change. Our mission is, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, empowerment of marginalized people. And the way that that we do it is through increasing incomes, uh, through the economic financial route. So uh, one of the things that has really helped us was um, being open to scale up. Because uh, initially when we started, we were, I was, my team and I were in, in the not-for-profit mode where we are comfortable with small businesses and pilot projects, which work, but then ultimately, you know, to make it sustainable, as someone mentioned in the chat box, you have to drive sales. So although we were resistant in the beginning and our angel investor actually who invested in us was pushing us to do this, and after a little resistance, we did it, and that's what's really helped us in the sense of uh, by scaling up, you you uh, have what is called you have the benefits of economies of scale. So, and in our case, in our country, we have so many women who are skilled, women and men, but especially women who are very skilled, and and we find that you know uh, investing in uh, in in the back end, in the sense that the, the normal thing is to do is to make good products and market it and try and get orders. But what we did really was to focus on developing the supply side of it, on, on you know, creating uh, spaces for women, safe spaces for women to work out of in their villages. Earlier, they were working from home. So uh, so we created spaces for them in their villages to work out of uh, where they could, uh, where, where we, we did not run into quality problems because we could supervise them better. They also, their output was better because at home they get disturbed, you know, someone wants tea, someone wants milk, etc. So uh, I think that's one, that's one, uh, uh, you know, first thing that I would say is to really to, to, to focus on what we are good at, which is really the back end and strengthening that, developing the back end, uh, creating capacity, building, building infrastructure, doing the trainings, for example, uh, are, you know, uh, while earning incomes is the first uh, first thing that all the women and men artisans want. Uh, what we do is we find those who are who show leadership and we have special trainings for them where they can become they can go up the skill matrix, become managers, uh, become members of our board and also, of course, uh, you know, invest in the company once they are earning enough and they have money to invest. So I think that that is the main advice I would give is that invest in the people, uh, you know, with whose lives you want to uh, make a transformation in. Well, Samita, one of the things that strikes me as you describe your business model and how you've scaled it is that you continuously go back to the question of what are we doing that supports women in this community and how are we putting them at the center? Um, we had a chance to work with EY this past year in developing an inclusive business playbook. And I feel like you could have written the playbook because, again, you keep asking yourself, what are we doing to create not just opportunity or decrease risk, but to really change the dynamic, change the power structure, create opportunities that weren't there before and always ask that question, what does this mean for the women that we want to serve? 
So frankly, one of the biggest reasons that we're excited to see more of this collaboration between corporations and social enterprises at the core of their business is we think this could be part of this bigger transformation, right? So again, it isn't just hitting the numbers or reducing risk, but it becomes about how do we change business itself by having a different conversation about the role of business? Um, so every time I hear social enterprises talking as if it's just a given, of course, the purpose of your business is to support the opportunities and needs of these women. Imagine if every business sort of thought that way um, and really centered on the most vulnerable people that that business touches um, and how to serve their interests. So again, just super inspired. I'm glad you could be with us today. I wanted to go to a question that did come in earlier that's a bit kind of a, a, a detail question, but I think a really important one. When companies are looking at operating in markets where there might be higher risks around corruption or governance, how do you find ways to work with social enterprises to really help them scale um, despite some of those challenges? And I'm just curious because corruption is an issue that comes up a lot, um, and I think it shows up differently in different industries. But how have folks, you know, tackled that? And I think IKEA, I know, uh, has shared or has developed um, that that resource for entrepreneurs. Within that, do you touch on issues of corruption and governance? Um, and, and how has that come up, I guess, for both IKEA and SAP um, in, in response to Mark's question? Yes, of course, that's a very important question and also part of our code of conduct. I actually posted a link to that if someone wants to read it in more detail later and also how we work with it. But I think it's about working together and safeguarding that the right procedures and processes and the organizational setups are in place. But also, I think, as Sumita was referring to, when it comes to trust, also building the trust of both sides, being transparent. If something happens, things can happen. But as long as we are open and transparent, we can always tackle them and also be aligned on what are the topics that we do not accept happening. Um, corruption or child labor or workplaces that are not uh, safe for the workers. Those critical basic topics that need to work for, for uh, the co-workers to have a safe uh, environment to live in and for us to be able to do business with them. So following the code of conduct, and doing it together in a more uh, development approach than doing a compliance test one and zero. So it's more right. how can we solve this? How, what is it? And how can we find a pathway to develop it? But what we also do, I saw that question as well, is that we do run accelerators, for instance, together with Acumen, where we actually uh, focus in on topics that are important if you want to do business with the corporate. And that could be a hands-on training, but we also have co-worker engagement on our side where our uh, business people becomes coaches and can guide and support social entrepreneurs into developing themselves into the next level. Great. And, and Alex, similarly for you, have you found any particularly effective ways of supporting organizations around some of those compliance or governance challenges? Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest that we haven't run into it that much yet, but that's only because we've only just started our journey. And we, at the moment, we've taken a market by market approach, right? So we're sort of taking country by country. That's going to change in about a year's time. Um, and then and then it's definitely something we have to look into more closely. But but I think similarly to what also was saying, I think the way that we're approaching it is. Is we're basically saying that we are very aware that we can just say, oh, let's procure from social enterprises and let's let's, you know, let's switch. We know that we have to invest just as much if not even more in um, capacity building for social enterprises and also in market development, right? Um, so, so, so very honestly, in what what happens is that you 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 try to develop programs, like also was mentioning in terms of accelerators, 
that help create that bridge for social enterprises to become corporate ready in every sense of the word. Um, and frankly, once you're in those kinds of programs, automatically trust starts to build because you're exposed to each other. You engage with each other. You might not have a partnership yet directly with each other, but you are very aware of each other um, and you're starting conversations. You start diving deeper um, into, into the work with each other. And I think because of that, you have a different kind of foundation where um, that trust that Sumita was also talking about sort of takes over in terms of the difficulties that um, that you might face otherwise from a market perspective, right? It's a bit yeah. of a wishy <laughs> response, I think. But <laughs> well, no, but I, I think it's a very honest response, right? And we've had some questions about, you know, how do you work with companies that may not yet have had access to capital? Um, is there a role for grant funding, which is a point that Joanne Sonnenschein raised, which I think is really important. And I think both of your organizations have looked at that. Um, in some ways, as we come to time, I just I want to emphasize, I feel like the work that we've been able to do with IKEA, with SAP and a few others kind of paints this really optimistic picture where companies have decided that social impact is core to their corporate purpose. And it is something that they feel accountable to. My hope is that this can inspire a lot of other companies to see not only the kind of um, moral need, but also the opportunity where companies are really distinguishing themselves by being able to make these kinds of products available. It's something that we know the benefits to corporations has been tremendous. You know, the way they engage their employees, the way that investors look at their company. These are things that we know are creating value on the corporate side and on the social enterprise side as well, creating huge opportunities for growth. But it does take a kind of leap of faith. Um, so again, it's exciting to hear how all of you have done that and how you've championed that within your own organizations. Um, and frankly, the more people come to the table, including investors who can help pave the way, whether with seed funding or growth capital or working capital, what we saw in our research is it makes all the difference for social enterprises to be able to seize on these opportunities to prepare themselves for corporate relationships. Um, so everybody has a part to play. We hope that the resources that have been shared by our panelists and by a lot of the participants um, will be helpful to those. And please do kind of think about ways to stay connected. Um, certainly there's a lot of interest in this topic at the um, COVID Response Alliance for Social Entrepreneurs, uh, but hopefully we've indicated some other uh, useful tools and resources that people can tap into. And I just really wanna thank everybody for their time, um, for sharing your stories, for your honesty, and to everyone who joined us um, as we wrap up um, but thank you all once again and have a great rest of the day.